Um, and before I really get started, I need to do this poll otherwise, because I don't know how to continue. Um, so and let me get my camera out, because this is going to be important. I just need to document this. Um, so how many of you guys want me to call this a GIF? <laughs> <laughs> and let's see a show of hands for people that want me to call it a GIF. You guys know that's not how he pronounces it, right? Cool. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm going to try to remember not to pronounce it the other way, which I never, totally never do. Uh, so hi, I'm Pavel um, at Makinai on Twitter. Um, I'm here repping uh, Vegas.js, our uh, Las Vegas-based JavaScript uh, meetup group, and here on behalf of Zappos.com, where I do uh, back-end mobile API development in Java. So when I get home, I'll be sure to tell them I really enjoyed the Java Fest, right? right? Um, I'm here with some buddies of mine, uh, Dan and Deshaun. Uh, Dan is speaking later, and you might have heard uh, uh, Dave uh, speak at Happy.js on like versioning APIs with Happy. Um, if you're in, in Vegas, uh, do stop by or, or look me up. Um, and I'm not going to make any presumptions that anybody here is a web developer, because JavaScript is everywhere now, right? Um, and I'm definitely not going to make any assumptions that you guys were web developers way back when this was a thing, because um, you all look so youthful. Um, it's not <laughs> creepy, right? Um, so uh, just in summary, the, the one by one pixel GIF is uh, taking uh, so, so nowadays we do positioning on, on web pages with CSS. It's very powerful. It's easy to move things around and, and uh, specify margins and padding and X, Y, Z position. Maybe not Z positions. Well, maybe in Dan's presentation you can do Z positions, but X, Y positions on the page. Um, and it's really nice. But, but back when the one by one pixel GIF workaround was created, there was no such thing. You basically had a page full options of like down to the right. Everything was down and to the right. Um, so the way to get around this was to take a one by one pixel GIF and just stretch it out and use that as a positioning. And my monitor hates this thing. It's fine. It's not OK, cool. Um, and so this is what that looks like. That's actually a, a GIF that's stretched out to whatever. Like, Is it still a pixel if it's stretched out? Because it's no longer like one pixel. It's like a whole, never mind. Um, this is basically what the code looked like. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it worked it worked surprisingly well except for the fact that then you had like all this this extra these extra images in your code and that violates something called like the semantic web um, the guy who invented the interwebs kind of likes that stuff and and and, uh, and what it is it's um, it's that you want want the, the, the content of, of the web page to take priority over the, the presentation so it can be um, referenced easily and, and used easily and parsed by machines and it's more usable. Um, and a an image that's invisible has no semantic meaning, so it kind of made Tim Berners-Lee cry a little bit. <laughs> um, does anybody know who this guy is? Obama. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, this man is named uh, Dave Siegel. Um, and, or Siegel? Siegel. Siegel. Siegel? No, not different guy, different guy. Um, and so if like Tim Berners-Lee and Eric Myers are like the patron saints of like semantic web and like, like um, I don't know, like good web design with standards, this guy's more of like a satanic priest with, with goat leggings that kind of like hops around and pokes young web developers with smoldering sticks to get them to do stuff. Um, you can't really blame him. Uh, so he wrote this book called uh, Creating Killer Websites. Has anybody, <laughs> has anybody read this? So this is uh, this is written back in 1996, and it had uh, in the, actually so Dave Siegel invented the one by one pixel GIF uh, trick, according to him, um, and and so it was it was broken to the world in this book. Um, so it's kind of like one of those things, um, but it's not just that. It wasn't just like this one little trick to make your web. You know, th this this book is like packed with workarounds of that sort, with all kinds of like little insidious like hacks and like using invisible tables for layout and stuff like that. Um, you can't really blame him though because you know at this time um, he might have been actually the first person ever to think about this as, as the point of view of like a web designer instead of a web developer. Um, and again like down to the right is not very flexible for somebody who came at it from print design. Um, 
he had a lot of interesting quotes. I'm going to read this to you because it's long and I know like attention spans. But uh, this is one of his quotes. If you want machines to read your web pages, use things like definition lists, unordered list headers, etc. If you want people to read them, don't do it. They take away your typographical control. Specify your own font sizes when you want a size change. If you must use bullets, make your own bullets. I don't see much point in bullets <laughs> if your vertical grouping is good. And try not to ever number your list items. It's hardly ever necessary. <laughs> so he had some crazy ideas, and yeah, probably made Tim Berners the cry a little bit. Um, but again, he was, he was from print design, um, and he was just not, I mean, he just wanted his web pages to look good. He was not apologetic for it at all. Um, I'm going to take you through a few of the tricks that, uh, that I used um, back then and that were kind of popular. Like, so I... I was a web developer back then, and I've used like probably all of these and done worse things. Um, for a while, I hosted uh, one by one gif.net because uh, I used the you know the single pixel images so much. Um, I was a pretty bad web designer back then. I'm still a pretty bad web designer, but now I use CSS, so that's cool. Um, so one of the ways you can use these is to indent your paragraphs. You just take like a uh, uh, a short and long uh, GIF. Uh, it's invisible, and you put it in front of your your paragraph. It works fine. There was no other way of doing this at the time. You could add extra spaces, but then the white space was canceled out. Um, so this is kind of the way it worked well, except for the fact you had to put it in front of every paragraph. And now you can just um, do that with like uh, text indent with CSS. It's beautiful. Um, you can do uh, em dashes. Um, you just make it a visible GIF, and you stick it in there. No, this, there's no. You, you could do like two text dashes. There were no. There wasn't a good way of doing this. Um, and you, so you can typographically good. There's no space between letters. It's supposed to be, it's like how it's supposed to be from a typographer standpoint. Um, it just wreaks havoc on like copy paste and it's, it's weird. Um, now we have HTML entities you can just drop in and, um, and it works great. Um, wasn't there back then. Um, you can control line spacing. So same thing as the paragraph indent, just, um, you know, vertical. Um, and I should at this time point out that the, the vspace and vlign we have there, they don't work anymore, not in HTML5, but they would basically just add spaces on the sides of them. Um, you can fake it with uh, width and height, by the way, which is how I got this to render it all. Um, so this worked great. There's another way of doing this. You could maybe at most like double space your lines and stuff, um, but this gave you precise control of, of your line spacing. Now you just use line spacing. It works really well. Um, this is more of, like the other things were kind of forgivable, there's another way of doing this. This is kind of like a what are you even doing? Um, so he, uh, this, is a, this is an actual Dave example. Um, he made a decorative like horizontal rule by using transparent purple, transparent, pur sorry, transparent GIFs and purple GIFs and made this weird thing that, that um, I don't even know, like he just constructed an image using HTML. There's no excuse for this, it was just like, <laughs> We had the technology, it was just like, just an image, right? And probably the amount of space that, that that one GIF would take up, even like a really long one, is less than all of this markup. It's horrible. Um, the other use um, that's pretty common uh, that you might be familiar with are, are, are web bugs, or we call them work creepy pixels for, for kind of tracking your visitors. Um, this one, this is kind of an aside, uh, this one you might be familiar with, this is what Google Analytics sends down. Um, like to track your visitors, and um, but considering that Google sends out like, I don't know, really large numbers of these per day, um, you might think that they want to compress it down as much as possible, and that's pretty true. Um, so a few years ago, um, somebody over at Probably Programming, whose name is not mentioned at all on the site, so I can't really give credit, um, kind of looked into this and uh, looked up the, uh, the, the formula of, of a GIF image and tried to find out what the smallest possible GIF was. Um, and it turns out, like, if you include all the necessary things, it's, it's 43 bytes. The one that Google sends out is 35, um, and it's a, it's a white pixel. Um, that's because they excluded the uh, the graphics control extensions, which make it transparent. So I, I don't know if this is true at all, but I like to think that there's somebody at Google who's looked at the numbers and was like, you know, two extra bytes, like, I would like to have a transparent image, but the savings of two bytes are just going to be too awesome. And I don't know if that, how that's working out for them, but that was there. Um, how am I doing on time? Am I good? Okay. Um, I just want to look at maybe like one other horrible, horrible hack. I mean, it's not that horrible, actually. Um, I use this one a lot, uh, which is rounded corners. Um, there was no good way of doing this in like 97. Um, so what we would do is we take these images in Photoshop 
and uh, give them a a trans or sorry a white background. No, sorry, a white foreground. The upper left is white, and the bottom right is transparent. And that way, if you put it up in the corner of one of your tables, you could change the color of the table, and the whole thing would change and be rounded. And it worked pretty well. I, I think like as far as horrible markup, it's not that bad. It's just like one table, um, but it's still not semantic. It's not an ideal solution. Um, and then Scriptaculous came out. Um, does anybody, anybody remember Scriptaculous? Do we have any fans? Yeah. So I think it's the best thing ever. The, the website kind of looks like, it's, it doesn't look that much more modern than that very first website we were looking at where this stuff was like centered in the circles. Um, I think we were going through some sort of like, all right, fine, we realize the images are bad and we're going to trust anything except for a bunch of images. So Scriptaculous made it so that you could like have your markup be clean, but then uh, there'd be some JavaScript that would make your corners magically round. Um, and they're like, okay, cool, that's awesome, it's perfectly clean. But the way it did it was by inserting like stacks and stacks of tiny, tiny divs. That's me moving my mouse cursor up and down across the, the debugger tool. So it's like so many divs for just these stupid rounded corners. And it's like, it's almost worse in a way, I think, than just sticking an image in there. Um, like, I understand images are bad, and it's kind of like, definitely a step in a different direction, but maybe not the, the right one. I don't know. Um, and so, like, I, am I allowed to have, like, a, like, a, like a lesson or, like, a something? Or are these supposed to be complete? So if there's a lesson to all of this, um, I want it to be this. Um, so if you make things kind of hard for people for, for things hard for people to do what they want, they're going to find ways of working around it. Um, and so, I mean, th that's good. I'm not going to discourage hacks. Hacks are like a very proud tradition of computer land people. Like, we all love hacks and stuff. Um, but the thing is, like, you know, if you find a hack um, and then you, you know, use it and, and it becomes, like, pretty convenient, it catches on, other people use it, maybe you, like, write a kind of opportunistic book about it and it gets out there um, and soon like the hack becomes commonplace um, it's gonna kind of hurt the internet maybe like or hurt JavaScript or something um, so like do your hacks but I kind of want you to be like a little bit a little bit thoughtful of them and so while you're doing the hack think about like how would I do this if the world was perfect and it was an ideal world um, because um, there are longer term solutions and um, like you can take your your, your ideas and, and, um, and just sort of share them out. There are, uh, this is the extensible web manifesto. Have you guys ever read it? So, so like the people who write browsers and rendering engines, they don't just like write them. They, they, they work off of standards and there's people that contribute to these standards. Um, and like those people could be you. Like you could, um, you could read the manifesto. It's really inspiring. And, uh, and like maybe read some draft specifications, look at them, give your commentary sign up to some mailing lists, you might like it and you might make like the future less painful for, for future you. Um, so that's all I got. I'm not going to mess with this, I don't know how to take this stuff off. <laughs>